I get the honor of being the MC for this track and also giving the first talk. Um, I'm Paul Dix, I'm the founder and CTO of Influx Data. Uh, today I wanted to just give a preview of what we're doing with InfluxDB version 2.0. So InfluxDB 2.0 represents for us the biggest change in the product since we switched over to InfluxDB 0.9. How many people were using Influx in the 0 0.8, 0 0.9 time span? Okay, so not too many, but for those of you who were, uh, for those of you who were not, 0 0.8 was obviously an early version that was released in November of 2014. Uh, and at the time, the API was different than it is now. Like, we didn't have a concept of like tags and measurements and fields in the API. So when we released 0 0.9, we added those concepts in, and basically it represented a breaking change. Um, now, with 2.0, we have a whole new API that we're introducing, but luckily, 2.0's functionality represents a superset of what's available in 1.0, in 1.x. So, what that means is there will be a clean migration path to upgrade from 1.x to 2.0. Uh, the, for, the file format of the time series data storage will change, but there will be a migration path to, to, to upgrade. And the other thing is that through configuration, there will be a compatibility layer that you'll be able to turn on. So you can accept writes uh, to an InfluxDB 2.0 server as though it were a 1.x server, and you can query an InfluxDB 2.0 server, again, as though it were a 1.x server. So you'll be able to put InfluxQL queries towards it uh, and, and see the data. So really quick about InfluxDB 2. It's MIT licensed, just like 1.x. Uh, the API in InfluxDB 2 is designed from the ground up to be multi-tenanted, which is actually very different than the 1.x API. And I'll get into that in a little bit. We've decided to take the tick components and collapse them into one binary, and I'll talk about that as well. It's open source, completely open source for the single server version, just like before. So let's dig into this telegraph influx to be chronograph capacitor rolled into one concept. So what I'm saying is basically tick is dead, kind of. So the tick stack, telegraph, which is the data collector, influx DB, obviously the database, chronograph, a user interface that we've built, and capacitor, the processing agent for doing ETL and real-time processing and monitoring of your data. The fact that we have these four separate components is kind of an artifact of how the company was built up over time. So basically in 2013, when we created the database, we released a, a prototype of it, people played around with it, and we saw what they were doing. And over the course of about six months, we saw there were a common set of tasks and problems that they were trying to solve. They wanted to collect the data, store it, query it, process it, and visualize it, and, and interact with it. So when I went out to raise the Series A in 2014, that was the pitch, basically give us capital so we can hire a team and build out these four separate components which we did individually. So the thing is like that was great in the initial stages because it allowed us to build them independently, but the truth is like these components are almost always used together. Like for instance, nobody that uses Chronograph is not also using InfluxDB because Chronograph is just the user interface for the stack. Same thing with Capacitor, everybody who's using Capacitor is also using InfluxDB. So what, what I wanted to do with 2.0 was kind of rethink the whole thing and rethink how I could opt, basically design a better user experience for people who are coming into the, into the stack. So the idea was to basically combine them all into one. Uh, and even Telegraph, even components from Telegraph are pulled into InfluxDB 2.0, but Telegraph is going to continue to live on as its own separate binary because it's a collector that's deployed widely across your entire infrastructure. So Flux, I, I kind of talked a little bit about uh, yesterday. One of the things I didn't mention, one of the design, one of the reasons we're doing Flux really, is because 
right now, if you're working in the tick stack, you have InfluxQL for querying data in real time, and you have tick script in capacitor for doing defining like processing and monitoring and alerting jobs. So what we wanted to do with Flux was have one language where people could use the same thing regardless of whether they're doing background processing or interactive querying. And that's what Flux is. It's basically a language to unify the stack. So after me, there will be some talks to talk more about the details of Flux and go into some of the advanced functionality. In this talk, I'm focused more on InfluxDB2 itself. So one of the things we have with it is basically a consistent documented API. So that means we have endpoints that are consistent for defining collection rules, for writing data, for querying data, <laughs> streaming and batch jobs, uh, creating dashboards, and all sorts of other stuff. All of these API components are defined in this Swagger file in the repo. So basically, you can see like the entire API is documented through this. If you wanted to create a client library, you can actually generate a client library in any language that Swagger is supported by, which is basically almost all of them. Uh, the other thing we're doing with 2.0 is that we're actually going to officially support client libraries and take them forward. So. In the history of InfluxDB, we haven't really had an officially supported client library. We essentially, we created the HTTP API and we threw it over to the community to basically define the client libraries for themselves, which means depending on what language you're working in, like the, the experience would be totally inconsistent, the way the libraries operated may be different. So essentially what we're focused on initially is a Go library and a JavaScript library that we own and are developed by us. Uh, our dev evangelist team is also going to be creating Python, PHP, uh, C. Uh, we have Java that's currently under the underworks, um, and also C Sharp, and basically a bunch of other ones, Ruby, all this stuff. And we're going to officially support those, and we're going to try to keep them consistent. We'll also have visualization libraries. This is actually, the UI in 2.0 is actually built on top of components that we've already published. So basically when we, we show a visualization or when we have like a, a drill down for administrative functions or anything like that, it's using these libraries. So before I dig into the data model of the API and how everything looks, I should probably talk really quickly about what multi-tenancy looks like in this system, right? In Influx 1, you basically you had an endpoint and you had a user and a password, essentially. And that was it. So in the multi-tenant system, you have like different roles. You have the operator, which is the person who installed InfluxDB and owns the operation of it, right? And they're the person who obviously has like total administrative control over it. You have what's called an organization administrator. So within the API, you have many different organizations, and those are basically boundaries for administration, right? So an org administrator can't necessarily do operator things, but they can do things like add users to their org and all sorts of other stuff. And then finally, you have users themselves. Users can obviously create dashboards. They can create background tasks uh, that do monitoring and alerting, uh, and they can dig through you know, and see what they can see. So let's look at the data model for 2.0. At the top, you have uh, organizations, right, which is really just like an administrative bucket. Um, within, within a large company, these could be individual development teams. Uh, for us, for our cloud product, for example, a different org would be a different customer. Within that, you have buckets. So buckets are replacing the idea of a database and a retention policy. Basically, they're being rolled into one thing so a bucket has essentially a duration attached to it, which is how long you want to keep data around. That could be infinite or it could be down to one hour. Um, but the idea behind buckets is, like, the reason why I picked bucket instead of database as a name is because traditionally when people think about a database, they think about a file structure that's associated with that. Buckets don't necessarily map to a specific file structure. They're an organizational concept. So the goal is that you could have thousands of buckets with an indi individual server, and that would be OK. Whereas InfluxDB1 is not designed to have thousands of databases, because those actually map to 
physically separate files on disk. So within the buckets, you have actually all of the time series data that you're writing, right? You have tasks. For the initial release of InfluxDB2 are basically batch tasks. Those are background things that are running. They can run on either a cron schedule or they can run periodically where you say once an hour, once a minute, whatever. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of other information associated with tasks. So in one sense, tasks seem kind of similar to CQs, but we're actually adding a lot more functionality to them that didn't previously exist. So we're adding log data to them. So basically, each individual execution of a task in the background will have a run log. So it will actually be associated with a specific run, so you'll be able to pull up the logs for that run and see what the result was. And what that means is it will be easier to troubleshoot what happens if something goes wrong in a task. And also, because the individual runs are identified with the block of time that they were computing, you can rerun them, right? You can retry a task, and all of that will be exposed through the API and also exposed through the user interface. Basically, everything in the user interface is built on top of the API itself. There's nothing in the user interface that you can't do through the API. And the API has, obviously, their client libraries, but there's also a command line interface so that you can do anything and basically, so you could script any sort of administration tasks you want remotely through the API. All right, so uh, dashboards. Dashboards are, are obviously the user-defined dashboards. Uh, we have users. So users can actually uh, belong to multiple organizations. So they can see data from multiple organizations if you give them that ability. They don't have to. They could be constrained to a single organization. And users have tokens. So basically, all API access happens through a token uh, that's kind of different than before. Like before, in InfluxDB1, you had this concept of a user and a password. But the truth is, what most people used it as was like it wasn't really a user and a password. It was some API or some programmatic access. So we tried to separate the concepts between a user who's pointing around and clicking things and a program that's accessing the API. So tokens are how you get authenticated access to the API and how authorization happens for what people want to do. So there are authorizations, like I said, associated with tokens. Can a user read from this bucket? Can they write to this bucket? Can they create a task? Can they update a task? Also, for all of the resources in the API, there's this concept of ownership, right? If a user creates something like a task, they own that thing, and then they have administrative control over it. So there's another concept called protos, which are basically like templates. And templates exist not just for like dashboards, but they also exist for tasks. You can create a proto of a task, say for monitoring and alerting, and anybody can then pick that up and fill in the variables to, to make it like a fully formed task. So one thing we added into was we added the ability to pull data, to scrape data. So we can scrape Prometheus style metrics directly into the database. So in the API, there's a concept of scrapers. These are, these are things that uh, an operator can configure and it can scrape directly in. So right now we support Prometheus, soon we'll support uh, the open metrics format as well. And finally, we have uh, telegraph, uh, basically, configurations. So in the user interface, you can create a telegraph configuration, and then uh, you can, uh, basically, the new updated telegraph can actually automatically pull its configuration from the InfluxDB2 API, which I'll demo here in a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, actually, one more thing, which was, uh, Basically, every resource in the API can have labels associated with it. So this is very similar to the way the Kubernetes API works. So anything can be labeled, and separately you can use this as a system to search for various things. So a bucket can have various labels for it. So say if you have high precision data, medium precision data, and low precision data in a bucket, you can use labels for that uh, to indicate that. Uh, tasks can have labels, dashboards can have labels, and the thing is, because you can search labels across resources, you could say, 
I have a label for uh, things associated with uh, MySQL server that I'm monitoring. So you could search for that and automatically pull up all of the tasks and dashboards and other things associated with MySQL servers. So the thing about 2.0 is like all of these things are baked into one binary that you can install really easily, but that's really just for the onboarding experience to make it super easy. You can also separate out these different pieces of functionality. So you can have an open source server that's storing all your data. You can have separate ones that are executing tasks. Uh, you can have a separate one that hosts your user interface. All right, I'm gonna do a quick demo and then Hopefully I can wrap this thing up. So uh, yes, I'm seeing a thumbs up from the back. All right, so the easiest way to get it up and running is just uh, through Docker, just doing a Docker run. We have uh, the images for the alpha hosted on key, uh, and we update these whenever we produce a new alpha. Right now we're producing a new alpha once every week. So if we run that guy, I have it showing up on 9999. Basically, here's the like welcome user interface. It's basically just the getting started thing, just so you get set up. Unlike InfluxDB1, you can't just start using it immediately. Also, you cannot turn authentication off. Authentication is always on. You always have to have a token to communicate with the API. So basically, this walks us through that initial setup experience. So, Paul. Uh, so here we see we have username, password, the organization. This is the initial org, right? Every all data is organized by orgs. I said it's multi-tenanted. So in order to do anything, we need to create the initial org, and we need to create an initial bucket that we can write data into. So I'm just calling it my bucket. So we continue, and then we're prompted with this, right? So the quick start, essentially, what it will do is it will start it up, and it will just configure a scraper that scrapes the local metrics from this server. So uh, in InfluxDB2, we actually use the Prometheus client library to expose Prometheus style metrics for how the server is operating, right? You can see that here at just slash metrics. So that's what the quick start is. Uh, you can also configure telegraph configs or you can just get, get to it and do your own thing. We're gonna go through the quick start here. So now this is basically the landing page, the welcome. We can see we can configure a data collector, dashboards, or explore data. Right now I'm just gonna jump over to the Explorer really quick so you can see that we have data in the system. So essentially like here, you can see, oh, here's the data here. So let's just filter it down to uh, HTTP requests. So basically what we're doing is we track everything, like every HTTP request has a counter, every single endpoint. So here you can see like, we have you know, different counters for each of the different API endpoints within the system, so you can track what's going on. Uh, so now, what I wanna do is I wanna show configuring a collector. Actually, and what you can see here in this admin interface is you have a spot to you know, administer your members, the buckets, the dashboards, the tasks, telegraph configurations right here, scrapers right here, like I said, we, by default, we created one, so we're just scraping the local metrics into the bucket. So here, show off the telegraph config. So let's go ahead and create a new telegraph. So it pops up with this. Right now, we just have some basic plugins, but our goal really over time is to create a user interface element for every single telegraph plugin that exists, which is hundreds at this point. Uh, so we're gonna have to automate that in some fashion. Um, so let's just configure it so we collect system metrics. We can skip all this because there's, really, uh, there's really no like, configuration to do for these. So we'll just skip to the verification step. So here we see install the telegraph agent, configure the API tokens. So basically that's this right here. So here you can see what the API token is. It's just this, this string right here. So we're gonna do that. We'll pop over here. 
We're just going to set that variable. And I already have Telegraph installed here. So then we're going to go here. And we are going to start Telegraph. So there we can see it's actually going to pull the config from the local InfluxDB server and start up. So that's what it does. So in theory, we should be collecting system metrics from this laptop right now. So here, there's a button to say, listen for data. OK, so we see that we have data there. So let's complete that and then go back to see if we actually have data in the system. What I would expect here is CPU data, for example. There we go, CPU data. Um, as I mentioned before, you can actually change what these are here to essentially say, OK, actually, because I don't know what measurement I have, I just want to say, OK, so what, like what tags do I have, right? So you can see the tags here listed, and these are for the entire namespace. But say I wanted to limit down to, OK, who has the CPU tag and who has CPU total? And then basically this field set, or I can look at the tags, Basically, this gets limited by what was selected before. So it's almost kind of like a faceted search kind of drill down thing. So initially, the tag space is very large. But once I select a tag and a value, it narrows down the search space. Uh, so one last thing to show really quick. So you can also view like the raw data. So this is the raw data format that the InfluxDB2 API returns. It's basically this annotated CSV format. And what you get is a separate table of results for each individual time series. So if you wanted, you could actually just download the CSV data and look at it in Excel or whatever you want to look at it in. And then finally, we have a script editor, which is basically just like the advanced mode for putting in a Flux script. And what I found is it's pretty useful like for playing around with Flux to switch over to this raw data mode and like issue, issue like steps of like queries in Flux. All right. That is the end of the demo. I survived. So if you want to play around with it, just go to the download page. Uh, Avoid the annoying marketing prompt, and at the top, it's just it'll lead you to instructions for how to play around with it. We have uh, a Mac binary, uh, the Docker images, and just tarballs. Um, the status of the project: uh, we released Alpha One about four weeks ago. We're going to do a new Alpha build every single week. So right now, we're on Alpha Four, uh, and the idea is the Alpha thing. It's not for production use. It's for playing around and testing it uh, and giving us feedback on the features and the user experience. We're going to continue to deliver features uh, in the alpha phase. Once we've actually finalized the feature set that we're happy with for initial, like what will be 2.0, uh, we will switch into beta mode. And when we switch into beta mode, that's when we'll do bug fixes and performance and stability stuff and basically just focus on that. Uh, I'm around all day, and uh, that's all I've got. Thank you.